Bleach is one of the best but most misunderstood series of all time. The manga is a master class in character designs and world building, and the anime takes all of these same elements but incorporates a euphoric soundtrack that elevates the series to even greater heights. But that same anime is one of the main reasons Bleach would become such a controversial topic in the anime community. At the time this video is being made, Bleach has amassed a mind-blowing $7.2 billion net worth, making its creator Takubo not only one of the richest manga authors ever, but I would argue that he became more influential to the current state of shonen than his more commercially successful rivals. Bleach inspired several of the most popular new gen series like Demon Slayer, Black Clover, My Hero Academia, and Jujutsu Kaisen. And it was pivotal in the fusion of anime and fashion culture. Bleach is just so stylish that it almost feels like we robbed the fashion world of Kubo's genius. And I do believe he is a creative genius. If you make it to the end of this video, I promise you, you will have a newfound respect for the series and its creator. Kubo's adventure to prominence is an epic tale of overcoming rejection, health issues, and and even surviving beasts with industry titans like One Piece's Ichiro Oda and Dragon Ball's chief editor Kazuhiko Turashima. I create weekly anime documentaries, and today we are taking a deep dive into the emotional roller coaster that is the controversial rise of Bleach. But the story of Noriaki Kubo, later changed to Takubo, begins on June 26, 1977. He was born in Fuchu, Hiroshima, Japan, to a father who was a town councilor member. Given his father's occupation, I speculate that he was raised kind of strict. This might explain his rebellious nature as one of the more edgy manga authors. From from early age, Kubo was completely obsessed with all things anime and manga, though he did have a darker taste than most of the kids his age. He had a fascination with all things spooky, and he tended to favor the villains whenever he did read more traditional shonen. By elementary school, he had already proclaimed to both his family and peers that he wanted to be a manga artist when he grew up, even though he had absolutely no idea how to make that a reality. Early on, he was a fan of Akira Toriyama. He read both of his works, Dr. Slump and Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball is what started Kubo's love for a good villain. He stated in an interview that he thinks of Dragon Ball as quote, the manga with the incredibly cool villains, and that it also taught him that good villains must be quote, strong, fearsome, and cool. But the two manga that Kubo credits as his favorite and earliest inspiration are Shigeru Mazaki's GGG no Kotaro and Mashami Kuramanda's Saint Seiya. GGG is a manga series that was created in 1960. It follows a young kid named Kotaro, the last survivor of a ghost tribe, and his adventures with other ghouls and strange creatures of Japanese mythology. This series is credited with the popularization of the Japanese Japanese folklore creatures called Yoka. Their great art in Kataro inspired our young Kubo to start drawing. He loved its dark and spooky themes, and he spent hours drawing his favorite characters from the series. He particularly had a fascination with the monsters in the series. These monsters would be the first characters Kubo would attempt to draw. He would spend hours on end trying to get his character to be as good as Mazaki's, but he claims he realized very early that he had a way more simple art style. It was a little later on when he fell in love with an anime series called Saint Seiya. The story follows five mythical warriors called Saint who fought wearing sacred sets of armor. Though the series was incredibly popular, many still consider its massive influence on manga and anime to be severely undercredited. Kubo directly cites Saint Seiya as being responsible for his focus on weapons in his works and his love for uniforms. Kubo is becoming obsessed with drawing because he spent so much time practicing his craft. By the time he got to high school, he had become a very introverted person. He had a very hard time expressing his thoughts and emotions through using his words. He spent a lot of time alone, finding it very hard to relate to his peers. This solitude led him to discover poetry. He fell in love with poems and how they could be so simple but complex at the same time. He started writing his own poems, mostly about his feelings and as a way of documenting his daily life. He would eventually combine all of them into a book. This would be his very first completed work. Personally, I feel like this helped Kubo later on in his career because he developed his own talent for making the most simple shonen tropes amazing. During this same time period, he also became fascinated with fashion. This interest in clothing designs would go on to impact his character design and help him cultivate his unique art style. Kubo even stated that he quote, often draws clothes that he wishes he could find in stores. I personally think that Kubo's fashion design deserves more praise and was way ahead of its time, but we will dive deeper into that later in this video. Manga was a good way for Kubo to combine his love for drawing, fashion, and poems. So eventually he worked up the nerve to tell his high school teacher that he wanted to be a professional manga artist. This conversation gave him the confidence to submit a manga that he had been working on into a competition ran by a manga publisher called Shueisha. Shueisha is one, if not the most popular manga publisher of all time, producing many of the most famous series ever. I'm talking Dragon Ball, Death Note, One Piece, Hunter x Hunter, Demon Slayer, Yu-Gi-Oh! If you heard of it in the West, it was probably produced by Shueisha. The manga Kubo put his faith in was a one shot called Fire in the Sky. Shueisha actually liked it, and they would shortlist it for the Hot Step Award. This award is given out to the most promising up and coming manga artists, the ones that the industry should be keeping their eyes on. And yes, this is the same award that we learned about in both the Togashi and Oda videos, as they both 
both won this award themselves. Winning this award is basically a shortcut to your talent being noticed and fast tracking you to becoming a professional mangaka. But unlike his future rival, Kubo would unfortunately lose the competition. This setback would hurt Kubo, but he wouldn't give up and he would keep practicing, which was a good thing because unknown to him, even though he lost, his talent was noticed by a manga editor who worked for Shueisha. The editor's name was Takanori Osada. The editor would call Kubo personally and was like, hey man, you got some promise. You should definitely try again in the future. He even offered to work with Kubo. Kubo was extremely flattered by the offer, but he would initially turn it down because in his own words, he quote, doesn't work well with other people. By the way, this is the same editor from our Dark Rise of One Piece video, the one that fought for One Piece when all the higher management thought it was a dumb idea. Osada really has an eye for hidden talent and deserves some major respect. The next year, Osada wouldn't give up. He would call Kubo again to check on him and encourage him to release another manga. And Kubo was ready this time. He would submit Ultra Unholy Hearted Machine in 1996. This manga follows the story of a gunslinging protagonist whose girlfriend gets killed by a drug called Ultra Unholy and his consequential journey to find the guy who created the drug alongside his new female partner. Soisha liked the one shot. They published it immediately in their flagship magazine, Weekly Shonen Jump. This manga was incredibly dark and gory and it towed the line for what even could be considered a shonen series. But it was really good. And by this point, his talent for character designs, unique story concepts and world building was really starting to show. This was also where we could really see Kubo attempt to blend his love for the horror of spooky genres with the shonen style of storytelling that was popular at the time. But though Ultra Unholy Hearted Machine was innovative, Kubo had terrible timing. With his unlucky streak continuing, 1996 would also be the same year that Ichiro Oda would release Romance Dawn, the original story pilot for what would become One Piece. People liked Ultra Unholy, but it was no One Piece. And because Shonen Jump runs off this popularity style serialization, Oda's work would beat Ultra Unholy, winning the final spot in the popularity poll. This resulted in Shueisha giving Oda weekly serialization over Kubo, slowing Kubo's career down for years. This would start a 20 year beef between Kubo and Oda. In 2017, Kubo stated on a radio show that he quote, hates Oda. Kubo explains that after being outvoted by Oda, he started to resent and dislike him, and even admitted that the two had several unsavory run-ins and spats in the late 1990s. At the 20th anniversary of Bleach art exhibit, Oda submitted the Luffy drawing in the Bleach art style, along with what some call a suspicious message. The message read, years ago, Kubo publicly announced, I hate Oda. So do you want to know if I hold a grudge against him? Yes, I do. He goes on to say that Kubo's statement didn't strike him as like particularly rude, but would continue by saying, actually, I don't dislike Kubo. I do consider him to have some audacity to make such a public statement, but I know he's an extremely competitive, talented, and pretty confident guy. Some feel that this is just some lighthearted banter between competitors, and people to this day debate the intentions behind these words. But I would be lying if I didn't feel a little pettiness in their comments. But I do love their relationship and how it feels like real life anime rivals. As you can tell, Kubo took this loss personal, and he would immediately put out his next work, Rune Master Ura. It would also get published as a one shot in Shonen Jump. This series revolved around the adventures of a female exorcist. This sounds like the part of the anime where he makes his comeback, but he didn't. The series didn't do very well, and it was denied for serialization. His dreams of becoming a big time manga artist was starting to feel very unlikely. These back to back L's were really starting to affect Kubo's mental health, but it was about to get a lot worse. During this time period in Kubo's life, his boss, or really his boss's boss, was a man named Kazuhiro Turashima, who was the chief editor of Shonen Jump. He was also the main editor of Dragon Ball and was responsible for discovering Akira Toriyama himself. And he even helped Toriyama on Dr. Slump and the original concept of Dragon Ball. To say that he is highly respected in the manga industry is an understatement. Torishima had gotten a hold of some of Kubo's work. And after reading them, let's just say he wasn't a fan. He called Kubo up and told him to get to Tokyo right now. When Kubo and his original editor arrived, they would be told to wait in the room. Suddenly, Torishima would walk into the room. Even before he made it to the table, he would already begin to berate Kubo with insults, saying that his manga was just terrible. Then he would take out the first volume of Dragon Ball and the first volume of Fist of the North Star and proceed to slam them on the table in front of Kubo and yell, go home and read these so you can become a better mangaka. Kubo remembers thinking, this bastard. These words were both hurtful and impactful to Kubo. Kubo had already been struggling mentally, mostly due to the insane amount of hours he had to spend drawing and brainstorming new ideas to keep up with Shueisha's impossible to meet deadlines. Now imagine your boss, who is one of the most respected and revered people in your field, straight up calls you trash and for you to try to be better at your job. Overwork culture in Japan is a problem. There is even a phenomenon in Japan called Kararoshi or overwork death that plagues the country. Many salary men often pass out on the sidewalks before even making it home from work from pure exhaustion. And the anime and manga industry is no exception. I'm 
manga artist who escaped the industry even referred to it as voluntary enslavement. Even anime animators are often overworked and underpaid. We already extensively covered this on how dark the expectation for manga artists can be in the other videos in this series, so I won't go too deep into it here. But that, combined with the verbal abuse from someone who controls your future, would break anyone. Normally, Kubo would have tried to take this as motivation, but he self-admittedly was sensitive around this time period, and he took the words very harshly. I mean, Kubo was only 18 or 19, so I'm amazed he stayed strong for so long. It was now the year 1997. Competition and quality in the manga world has risen even higher than ever. Manga like Roni Kenshin and Initial D was running the chart, and there would be one other reason why this would be a paradigm shifting year for both Shonen Jump and manga. This was the year that One Piece would be officially released. The successor of the one shot that defeated Kubo years earlier would launch, and it would be an instant smash across all of Japan, making Shonen Jump more successful than ever. As for Kubo, this would continue to be his most depressing year yet. In a last ditch effort to land serialization, he would produce a one shot called Bad Shield United, but without hesitation, it too would be rejected. Now Shonen Jump is sounding a lot like bullies by this point, and in some ways they are, but they have also been reports that they did believe in Kubo's talent. They just didn't think he was rising to his max potential. They wanted him to be more. Kubo admitted that he had been given 45 blank pages in Shonen Jump Weekly for him to draw what he wanted, basically a blank slate for him to at least try some one shots. Kubo even acknowledged he understood that this is very unusual for an artist to be given this many pages guaranteed for publication, but it's kind of hard for anyone to produce that many new quality ideas and works weekly, while at the same time being told by your supervisor you are trash. Jump even told Kubo that they would produce the 45 pages blank if he didn't come up with anything for the entire world to see. I guess this was more of motivation, but to me it was more like a threat, because it's definitely not the motivation I would want, and neither did Kubo. He said he didn't even like most of the one shots that he was putting out in this time period, that he often couldn't even read them after he finished them, because he felt embarrassed by them. He just felt immense pressure to draw, and this was just a really dark time for him mentally. This last rejection was just too much, and his mental health spiraled downward even more. Even though he basically was a full-time manga artist by this point, he couldn't even enjoy it, because he was beginning to severely doubt his talent and work ethic. Kubo only had a few friends and a couple of assistants. Even though he's mentioned several times that he prefers to work alone, he said he actually liked his assistants. But because of his lackluster situation, he would cut everyone off and spend two years in isolation. With this limited contact with the outside world, Kubo spent two years thinking about what it means to be a mangaka. He had also realized that previous to the various one shots he was being forced to put out, he had no idea what went into the creation of professional manga. So he collected all of his thoughts and what he learned, and he realized that being a full-time mangaka was still his dream. So he began working on his next project. When his editor found out about this, he told Kubo if he wanted to do this, he should prepare eight chapters worth of work and submit it all at once. That they should be shooting for weekly serialization. But he warned Kubo to not get his hopes up and that it would most likely not get picked up. Kubo had basically given up drawing up to this point and his editor was trying to help motivate him to start drawing again because he really did believe in Kubo's talent. His editor has also came out since then and said that he gave him this challenge so Kubo could prove to him that he was still excited about the idea of being a manga artist, even with all of his hardships. Shortly after in 1999, Kubo would get the courage to give it one more shot. He put everything he had learned over the years into a manga called Zombie Powder. The story follows a boy named Elwood Shepard who joins some mysterious criminals in their search for the Rings of the Dead. The rings are a group of legendary artifacts with the power to resurrect the dead and grant immortality to anyone who collects all 12 of them. The series had a gunslinging western theme mixed with some modern conveniences, occult magic, supernatural martial arts, and mad science. His work was always darker than a typical shonen. After Kubo submitted Zombie Powder to Shueisha, all he could do was sit and wait, but he wouldn't have to wait long because in the very next editor's meeting, Kubo's manga was immediately approved for weekly serialization. Even though he didn't follow any of the rules, technically you have to submit at least three chapters worth of material if you even want a shot at serialization to give the hires up a grasp of where the story could go. And if you remember, his editor suggested for him to submit at least eight to give him some extra good graces, but either Kubo knew he had something or he just didn't care. Either way, Kubo only submitted one chapter of Zombie Powder, but it was still picked up right away. Kubo was now a full-time Shonen Jump manga artist. It was the first time his dream had officially come true. And if you would like to help me with my own dreams coming true of being the king of anime YouTube, just like this video and subscribe. The like goal for this video will be 203, and thank you so much for 10,000 subscribers. Although this was an awesome time for Kubo, it was also complicated. So you remember how Kubo hated making them one shots against his will? So it turns out he was submitting them at the very last second before his deadline as a form of rebellion against his publishers for never listening to him and forcing him to work nonstop. I mean, he couldn't make them give him vacation or ease up on the workload, so he had been using this as a way to stand up for himself. And if you remember Togashi's story, I wish this was something he had done. But now that Kubo 
was a weekly artist, he had to move to Tokyo and he was under direct supervision. He was even required by contract to submit his work a week ahead of publication. Since the Takaban magazines juggle so many different mangas, this kind of made sense. So it's debated that this played a part in them making such a swift decision. There are dozens of articles claiming that Kubo and his editors hated each other. But after reading more reliable sources, I don't think this was true. It honestly feels like they did believe in him, but was terrible at showing it. They were trying to force him to draw because they had sensed that he was starting to lose confidence. And moving to Tokyo was a way for them to watch over him and make sure he doesn't waste his talent. Kubo was a person who likes to do things his own way. And this is a trait of many geniuses. And I, and apparently many others, do think that Kubo is a creative genius. In short, Jump knew they had found a prodigy, but they wasn't able to force him to do what they wanted like other mangaka. Because I know how manga publishers can be, I get why Kubo was doing it. But I also get Jump's goal, even if they went about it in the worst way possible. Even in the end of Zombie Powder Volume 3, he left a message speaking on his mindset at the start of the series. Quote, due to certain circumstances, I began Zombie Powder in a severely unstable mindset. At first, I couldn't forgive what myself had drawn and couldn't even look directly at the final draft. I was unable to somewhat even tolerate it to around book three. Now please read, this is my manga. To me, it sounds like at the start of Zombie Powder, it was just another job that he was being forced to do. But throughout creating the series, he had began to fall in love with drawing again. But it's unfortunate it took him three volumes for him to come to this realization. Years later, Kubo will reflect back on this time period. In a 2012 interview with Shonen Jump Alpha, Kubo said that the most important thing he learned from Zombie Powder was always follow your heart and that he should draw what he wants to draw. I think we should all follow this message. That's why I'm still praying this YouTube thing works out. Kubo goes on to say, when I was working on Zombie Powder, I was still holding back. I wasn't used to weekly serialization and I was mostly just trying to react to my editor's comments. And now I'm focused on staying true to my own style and creating what I want to. Basically with Zombie Powder, Kubo was still only putting in half effort, which wasn't a good thing because 1999 was an amazing year for manga. The manga community and Shonen Jump have became even more competitive. Several hit manga series were all being serialized at the exact same time, which was great for manga fans, but bad for aspiring manga artists. Prince of Tennis, One Piece, Ronnie Kenshin, and Hunter x Hunter were just a few of the iconic manga that was all running the charts this year. Then there was the rising star of the manga world that came out in September of that year, Naruto, a Shonen Adventures series about a young ninja. Although Zombie Powder was good, there was only so much room in the weekly magazine, and the Jump editors would drop Kubo's work after only 27 chapters, sending him crashing down back to the bottom, while his contemporaries like Oda and Kishimoto were reaching astronomical successes. But unlike last time, Kubo wouldn't let this get him down. He had tasted success, and even though he was aware of the tough competition, he believed his style was unique, and that his talent was just as good, if not better, than any of the top mangaka. Kubo would take a year off, and decided he would only submit a manga when he developed something that he enjoyed drawing. During this year-long hiatus, is when Kubo came up with the original concept for what would become Bleach. But this concept was far from the Bleach we would eventually be blessed with. This pilot would be submitted to Jump and immediately rejected. But not because it wasn't good, because it wasn't great. The editors were scared to have a repeat of Zombie Powder. Jump thought Kubo had godly amounts of potential, but feared if they published something that wasn't his best and then he failed again, he might hang up his drawing skills for good. So they were forcing him to refine his story until it was the level of work that they believed he could create. Now this rejection would hurt Kubo especially hard because this was the first story he really wanted to tell and he seriously thought about calling it quits. But Kubo would get an unlikely letter that would change everything. The letter was from the legendary Akira Toriyama. He had came across a copy of Bleach's pilot and he thought it had amazing potential. He would eventually call Kubo and encourage him to not give up and to just rework some ideas. These words meant a lot to Kubo. Not only is Toriyama one of the most famous and respected manga club of all time, he was literally one of the reasons Kubo started drawing in the first place. And after reading this, my respect for Toriyama Yama skyrocketed. I mean, he was at the very top of the manga world at the time, and he didn't have to take time to do this. Kubo would start from the beginning. This is a speed run of the creation of Bleach, from concept to serialization. So before Bleach was Bleach, it was called Snipe. While trying to come up with ideas for manga, Kubo actually designs his characters first, and then decides their personalities and story beats after. He said they usually come natural. This is actually backward from how most manga authors design stories. For the manga that would eventually become Bleach, the very first protagonist Kubo would design would actually be Rukia, not Ichigo, and she would wield a scythe, not a sword. As a matter of fact, she was the only character with a bloody weapon at all. All the other characters would use guns, hence the name Snipe, short for Sniper. By the way, does anyone else get major Maka from Soul Eater vibes from the early Rukia design, or is it just me? Bleach came out first, that's all I'm saying. Anyway, Kubo explained all this and how it led to the creation of Bleach in an interview with Shonen Jump. SJ asked, why did you pick Bleach as a title? And Kubo responded, the title wasn't Bleach when I decided to draw a story about Soul Reapers. This was before I drew the one-shot manga that that appeared in Akamura Jump. The 
weapon wasn't even a sword, it was a scythe. Only Rukia had a scythe, and all the other characters used guns. At that point, the title was Snipe, as in Sniper. Right before I started drawing, I began thinking that a sword would be better, and then I realized I couldn't use Snipe as a title anymore. I began looking for a title that grasped the bigger picture. Soul Reapers were associated with the color black, but it would have been boring to use black. And then I thought, white on the other hand, can suggest black as a complementary color, so I chose bleak to invoke the impression of the color white. Okay, so basically, Kubo started with Rukia, then he switched to guns and scythe for swords, and he knew he wanted to incorporate mythology into his story because of his influence of Saint Seiya, GGG Kataro, and maybe Berserk. Many people had pointed out some similarities between Gus and Ichigo's backstories. Given Kubo's love for the dark fantasy genre, I'm sure he was a massive fan of Berserk, since it's arguably done the genre the best. And let's also sprinkle a little Yu Yu Hakusho influence in there. So through all this, Kubo eventually landed on a story about Shinigami, or Gods of Death. He thought it would be cool, and also a way to deal with his own fears of death. And then he decided to put them in kimonos. One, because he loved the idea of uniforms, and two, since they were very popular in Japan at the time, and he could just make them all black, because you know, Shinigamis. Rukia was created to offset what he felt was a very dark manga. The name Rukia translates to Heaven's Follower, so he had his female lead. Next, he needs a strong male counterpart. He kind of already knew that he wanted someone who wanted to protect their friends and family, so he came up with Ichigo, whose name has three meanings. Ichi means one and Go means five, so the combination is a play on words of 15, which is Ichigo's age at the beginning of the series. The number 15 can even be spotted on his bedroom door, and his birthday is July 15th. Secondly, the kanji for his entire name, Ichi Go Korasaki, can be translated as the one who protects, which is the kind of person he wanted Ichigo to be. Third, and the only one I picked up before I even started this video, is a reference to his fiery orange hair, and Ichigo's name directly translates to strawberry, which I know aren't orange, but I kind of just for some reason assumed it adjacently has something to do with his hair. So now he had Ichigo, Rukia, and a bunch of death gods who cleansed corrupted human souls and protected the balance between the human world and the soul society. The world was almost perfect, but because it was initially rejected by his editors and the aforementioned call from Toriyama, he decided he needed something to make Bleach really stand out from every other series on the market. Something to give it that edge. Get it? Edge? Because of sorts? Never mind. He basically had an epiphany and Zanbakuto were born. More specifically, each Soul Reaper would have their very own individual Zanbakuto power. He also completely restructured the power system. Shika, Banka, and Kato were born. He also developed an affinity for villain groups. He said it was very easy for him to draw entire groups of characters at once. I feel like designing characters is Kubo's favorite part of manga creation. This might explain why Kubo has made some of the best and coolest characters ever. Both his male and female designs are generationally stylish. When Kubo had his perfect vision, the editors loved his new take on Bleach, and they would decide to publish it as a one-shot in Akamaro Jump instead of their flagship magazine Shonen Jump. It was just too full at the time. Bleach would receive immediate praise and positive feedback from the Jump readers. The amount of love it received pretty much forced Jump's hand, and Bleach was moved to Shonen Jump for weekly serialization. Over the next few years, Bleach would become a massive success. It would receive an anime adaptation in 2004, which would also be a big hit. The success of the Bleach anime launched the sales for its already popular manga into the atmosphere. Kubo had defeated all the odds, recovered from all his rejections and failures, and the coolest part of all, he did it while being himself. He went from the lowest of the lows to the very top. During the 2000s, Bleach would make millions of dollars from manga sales, anime adaptations, full-length movies, games, and merchandise. Kubo's manga had now become one of the best-selling manga series in the world, alongside One Piece and Naruto. These three manga were dominating every sales metric and chart imaginable, and eventually would become known as the legendary Big Three. The Big Three got their name from carrying Shonen Jump in the early 2000s. These three would be pivotal in the surge in anime and manga's international popularity. There has been many other series that came and went before and after, but none that stayed as popular and consistently relevant as the Big Three did. To this day, they are responsible for some of the most heated anime debates on and off the internet. At the time this video was being made, Bleach has sold a mind-blowing 130 million plus copies, making it one of the highest selling mangas of all time. Kubo had done it, but as many of you know, the good times wouldn't last forever. Bleach fans would be heartbroken when the anime would get cancelled in 2012 and the manga would end only four years later. But what happened? The reason Bleach ended is complicated, because it is a combination of many reasons. The first being the workload. Being a serialized weekly manga artist seems to be one of the most brutal careers, physically and mentally. I have read in recent years that publishers have eased up, but most of the manga legends came up in a time where the pressure from publishers was unrelenting. Think about the things we learned from our videos. Oda only slept three hours a night, only seen his daughter once a week, and was hospitalized. Togashi completely destroyed his body, till eventually he needed help to both shower and use the bathroom. And similar things happened with Kubo. Working 15 to 20 hours a day with no days off, never seeing his family or friends, it took a toll on his body, making deadlines became harder and harder to make. Kubo said in the interview that after 
after he finished the final arc of Bleach, not only did it make him feel lonely because he actually just missed it, but he had discovered that he had drawn the entire last arc of Bleach with a tore tendon in his arm. Secondly, Bleach had just seen a decline in popularity, brought on partially by the anime adaptation. The problem with the Bleach anime is it's just a roller coaster of highs and lows. It starts off strong with the Age of Shinigami arc, and then next was the Sneaky Entry arc and the Rescue arc. The arcs are kind of connected. It became one of the most beloved arcs in anime. It is still considered a career high for many Bleach viewers. But then when we get to the Bounce arc, things take a turn. This was the biggest flaw in the Bleach franchise. The fillers. Out of Bleach's original 366 episodes, 164 are fillers. That's about 45% of the entire anime. That is just insane. To put that into perspective, One Piece only has about 9% fillers, and that's with a thousand episodes. Bleach didn't have filler episodes, it had filler seasons, which can be hard to get through with streaming, but this was back in the day when you had to watch anime weekly on TV. So imagine this, you're watching your favorite anime, and then a filler you don't like starts, and it's two years before it's canon again. The reason for the consistent fillers is that the Bleach manga kept catching up to the Bleach anime, and instead of a hiatus, they opted for fillers, which didn't go over well with the fans. Now, I don't hate the Bleach fillers as much as many people do, well, not all of them, but there are a lot of things I like about the Bounce arc, but that's a video for another day. The Fullbringer arc was the last canon arc of the anime before it would eventually get canceled. Though it was canon, it was as badly received as some of the filler arcs. I personally think the Fullbringer arc is underappreciated. It added a lot to Ichigo's character both emotionally and psychologically. I think the reason the Fullbringer arc is hated so much is it wasn't as action-y as some of people's favorite Bleach arcs was. But that was never the story Okubo wanted to tell. One of the reasons I liked Bleach so much at the beginning because it felt like a perfect blend of slice of life drama and shonen action, which made it feel more real to me than other series. So if you watch the Fullbringer arc, not as a finale of Bleach because it was never supposed to be, but a piece of a greater story that's used for development, it's a much more enjoyable series. By the time the views for Bleach got so low that Kubo discovered it would be canceled, Kubo was just starting to draw the thousand year blood war arc in the manga. Kubo discussed this in an interview with Viz. He said, I think I started drawing the thousand year blood war arc around the time it was decided the anime would end. And up until then, I had begun to start drawing the manga with television guidelines and restrictions in mind. So I didn't go all out with the battle scenes. But with the anime ending, I didn't have to worry about any of that with the thousand year blood war. He went on to say that he went so hard, he felt like if this arc ever was animated, he was worried the producers would cut some of the scenes. Now he was drawing his manga how he wanted, which is where Kubo really flourishes. But he couldn't decide, should he keep drawing Bleach and risk it fizzling out over time now that the anime had ended or end it before that even happens? Then the choice became clear. A letter arrived from a fan of the Bleach manga. It was from a kid who was hospitalized. The kid proclaimed that he didn't have long to live and that he was so bored and that nothing was entertaining to him in his last couple months until he discovered Bleach. He absolutely loved it, so much so that it made him enjoy life again and it even gave him hope. The kid ended the letter encouraging Kubo to end Bleach the way he wanted. Kubo was touched. He had known how he wanted Bleach to end since the very first day he started the series. So he began working on an ending that took place after the Thousand Year Blood War arc. And even though the manga's ending is heavily debated, the last few scenes are exactly how he wanted to wrap up the story. When the Thousand Year Blood War art would eventually be animated, it would completely dominate the anime community. The animation was god tier. It was faithful to the manga and Kubo was heavily involved. And fortunate for us, he didn't have to cut any scenes since more graphic anime had gotten more popular over the years. Most of them inspired by Bleach. The love for Bleach's anime return sent its manga sales soaring again. With Bleach finally getting its just do flowers, let's make sure we all understand just how impactful Bleach was to the current state of anime. The human killing monster trope. Chainsaw Man, Demon Slayer, and Jujutsu Kaisen all revolve around organizations of people devoted to fighting human killing monsters, predominantly in urban city settings. Even Bleach taking place in a modern metropolitan city was very different at the time Bleach premiered. Most shonen took place in villages on adventures through the countryside or in a time period that predated modern society altogether. But most modern artists have chosen to opt for cities as a center of their adventures. And if you notice, most of them have a fascination with former humans turning into monsters that become addicted to killing humans. Well, in Bleach, these are called hollows. Hollows are a race of creatures which are born from human souls who for various reasons do not cross over to the soul society after they die. They have supernatural powers and they love killing humans. In Demon Slayer, we have demons. In Tokyo Ghoul, they are ghouls. Chainsaw Man, it's devils. And in Jujutsu Kaisen, the primary antagonists are curses. All of these are different mangakas takes on Kubo's hollow concept. The most obvious is Jujutsu Kaisen. 
Islands. As not only is the curse concept the same, but many curses even share visual similarities as a form of homage to Kubo. Many curses look like they might pop up in Katakura Town. It's most likely an homage. Even the most powerful versions of these separate series creatures seem to be inspired by Kubo's take on the evolution of Hollows, as the upper moons in Demon Slayer and the special grades in Jujutsu Kaisen seem to be inspired by Bleach's Espada when you put them side by side. Jujutsu Kaisen would take this a bit further, because even these creatures' leader is inspired by Bleach. You know how Ghetto was one of the strongest monster hunting heroes before he switched sides and decided to join and lead the most powerful of the creatures as a sort of rebellion against the status quo? But before there was a Ghetto, there was an Aizen. The similarities between these two characters are so close, it's impossible to not notice if you've seen both series. This concept is adjacently connected to the next one that might be Kubo's most liberated idea yet. The hierarchy of special protagonist organizations that combat said evil monsters. The Bleach series mainly revolves around an organization of hollow killing soul reapers called the Gote 13. They are the primary military branch of the Soul Society that is filled with various ranks of Zanpak toe wielding soul reapers. The soul reapers are separated into squads and each squad is headed by a captain who is chosen by the headmaster for being one of the most powerful and competent soul reapers. The only reason Ichigo is able to do what he does is because he was given a substitute soul reaper title. So let's compare the Gote 13 to Demon Slayer's Hashira power structure and Black Clover's Magical Knight's power structure. All three are hero based organizations revolving around a hierarchy under captains with each captain commanding their own squads, companies, or teams. Chainsaw Man, Tokyo Ghoul, and Seraph of the End also have a similar power structure implemented into their world building, but not as one to one. But this is all for good reason. It's an amazing way to add immense depth into your world building without spending a huge amount of time over explaining. It also allows you to power scale both protagonists and antagonists almost immediately. If by this point you still think I'm reaching, let's hear what the authors themselves have to say about Kubo and Bleach. In 2016, the author of Demon Slayer was asked what manga inspired him to write Demon Slayer. He said, quote, there are too many to count, but if I had to pick three, there would be Jojo's Bizarre Adventures, Naruto, and most directly, Bleach. He would go on to elaborate that the Gote 13 military branch was brought up a lot during his meeting with his editors when he was first discussing Demon Slayer. The author of Black Clover told Shonen Jump that Bleach was a major influence over him and that Kubo serializing it for so long must have been a lot of work. Even My Hero Academia's creator did an interview with Kubo where he was discussing in length just how influential Bleach was to him. He said he had never drew anything resembling manga till after he read Bleach in middle school. He would spend hours drawing Bleach inspired art of different characters holding Zanpot toes with their own powers that could activate into Banka. If you notice, Jujutsu Kaisen has got brought up the most and that may be because its creator might be the biggest Bleach fan yet. The author of Jujutsu Kaisen has given Bleach credit for inspiring him on several separate interviews. He has even given an example that Toto, a fan favorite, was inspired by the brutality and straightforwardness of Kenpachi Zaraki. Akutami and Kubo would even do an interview together a few years ago where Akutami would tell a story of how Bleach was the series that introduced him to the idea of being a manga creator and he reveals to Kubo that he had even compiled a collection of Bleach inspired poems called The Cloud Giant. He goes into detail about one of the things that stood out to him while reading Bleach was how stylish it was and it was cool to see that Kubo was just as stylish in real life. He just sounded in awe of Kubo which was really heartwarming to read as a fan of both series. From my research for this video I'm convinced that the core of Kubo's influence comes from his character designs. Bleach is just packed with some of the coolest, best dressed, and unique characters of all time. Some of my favorites are Shinsui, Grimjow, Yorichi, Kurosaki, Ukiora, Haribel, Yorichi, Shinji when he was first introduced, Lisa who is one of the most underrated girls in Bleach, Isagi, Zaraki, Kanami, Rukia, Yuhara, Toshiro, and Yorichi. If you're thinking like, man, that wasn't enough characters, you missed a few. I did. Kubo is so good at coming up with characters that this section could go on and on. I didn't even touch the cast of the Thousand Year Blood War. But let me know in the comments, which character do you think has the best design in Bleach? I'm super curious. Kubo was also one of the earliest mangaka to put some respect on black character designs. One of the things that helped Bleach characters stand out was just how impeccable well they were dressed. Kubo's characters are some of the few that actually change clothes. I wish more artists would do this. Kubo let his love for fashion bleed into his work, and for my knowledge, he was one of the earliest fusionists of streetwear and anime. Now the two go hand in hand. Besides just in the main story, Kubo's color spreads were filled with the most insane art of Bleach characters just dripping for no reason. I feel this influenced and changed anime and fashion's relationship forever. As of today, Bleach has returned to be more successful than ever, and he has released a Bleach spinoff called Burn the Witch that is oozing with style and has loads of potential. Kubo was a lead character designer on the video game Sakura Wars, and he has won many awards for his writing as well as 
Kuro's been given his flowers by all the manga artists he inspired. Hot Kubo has accomplished everything he has ever set his mind to and is living his life his own way. It's important to mention just how much other cultures influences Kubo's work. He has a fascination with German and Spanish culture that is sprinkled throughout the names, outfits, and music in Bleach. This is just another testament to his talent of fusing various concepts. Bleach is known for great music, and that might be because Kubo loves music in real life. He said in the interview that he always blasts music when he is designing his characters. He just feeds off emotion and that he doesn't even like to draw background art because it distracts you from the character's emotions. This is another thing that became more prevalent after Bleach, like you can see in the Black Clover manga. Series like One Piece and Naruto often have an abundance of background art. All of this is important to Kubo's creative process. And I left it at the end because, well, I almost forgot to add it. But this is kind of a reward to making it to the end. I don't know if I convinced you how great Bleach is or not, but I hope this video made you respect how many times Kubo never gave up and the amount of talent the man has. If you made it to the very end, say strawberry in the comments so I know you're real.